Why? Why are we here? Why are we going to talk about stories? Why is this guy holding the big bad wolf? And I have to tell you, I love this big bad wolf. It comes with grandma already inside. So you can have that right there. You get it at Ikea. Oh. Because. Because humans are hardwired for stories. If you want to persuade job candidates to come in and join your company, you need a story. You want to persuade prospects to get on board, you need a story. If you want to persuade investors, you need a story. I wish you could have been there the day that Bill Woodich gave me a call. Bill Woodage said, Henry, you don't know me, but there are four <coughs> magic words in the English language. And I said, well, what are those, Bill? I want to know the four magic words. He said, I know a guy. And I've called around. And I'm looking for somebody. And everybody says, I know a guy, Henry DeVries. That's the guy you got to talk to. I said, wow, Bill, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, what is it that you want to talk about? Bill said, I want to be a best-selling author and professional speaker. And I said, wow, Bill, you want to climb a mountain. He said, let me convince you. So I came up to Orange County. Bill was 58 years old at the time. It was two years ago. He was at a crossroads. He was very successful. He has a company here in Orange County that is a construction insurance company. Million dollar business, 100 employees. As a matter of fact, Bill confided in me later. He said, you know, Henry, I looked and looked for years and years, but I never found the right woman. I never found the right woman to marry. So I poured all my energy into the business. And I've grown the business. I talked to some of his employees, and they said he was the most motivating boss they had ever had. He taught them how to be problem solvers. And they went from nothing to making six figures. Bill was such a nice guy that if they didn't have the right clothes to wear when they started, Bill bought them the right clothes. But Bill said to me, Henry, I, I'm... I'm at a crossroads here because I didn't get what I wanted in life. I said, Bill, what did you want? He said, I want to be a best-selling author, and I want to speak to 10,000 people at a time. I said, Bill, you want to climb Mount Everest. That, that is a big climb. But there was something in, in Bill's conviction. I said, if, if you want to climb that mountain, I'll be your Sherpa. Let's go. Bill was prolific in writing. He had written 90,000 words in blogs. And it about broke his heart when I said, not those words. At least, not two-thirds of them. We just need the best words. It wasn't easy for Bill. Uh, I got him a speaking engagement before the book was done at Qualcomm International Headquarters, a room with 150 executives. And afterwards, an executive came to me and said, Wow, that man is dynamic. That man is full of passion. I have no idea what that man was talking about. <laughs> we had to work on message. We had to refine the message. And then we had to get Bill out to the media. So we got him interviewed by print publications. And then we got him interviewed by radio shows. Let me tell you, the radio shows, uh, you get called at 4 a.m. here in California because it's 7 a.m. on the East Coast and you're going to talk to the Orlando Morning Zoo and let me tell, oh, tell us about your new book and you're trying to get woken up. But Bill did it, whatever it took. Bill did local TV. I, I helped him finish the book by saying, Bill, here's what your book's about. Fear. Fear never sleeps. It's about the fear we all face and you are the most motivating person I know about getting through the fear. And you have these great stories on how to get through the fear. 
And he had a motto. His motto was always forward. And that became the title of the book. As I said, we did publicity. We got him on local TV. And then our big break came. Bill was invited to be a guest on the Steve Harvey Show to talk about his book and to encourage the listeners. No, Bill did not talk to 10,000 people that day. Bill spoke to 2 million people that day. And Steve Harvey liked him so much that he made him a regular guest on the show. He's just made his third appearance. And Bill is a professional speaker. He's been paid up to $10,000. He speaks to room of five, a room of 500, 1,000 people. I, I took him out to dinner. Yes, me uh, took a millionaire out to dinner. I did not go to Denny's. I didn't take him to McDonald's. I took him to a nice steak restaurant out in Laguna Beach. And I said, Bill, I just wanted to tell you that it took two years and you did it. You proved to me you wanted to climb that mountain. And Bill got choked up. He said, those were the words I wanted to hear most of all. If I have one piece of science to share with you today, it's humans are hardwired for stories. We're going to talk about that. But first, you came here because you want to get investors. You want, get, you want sharks to invest in your company. Well, let me tell you something about Shark Tank. Scott Salyers is a casting director for Shark Tank. He interviews 40,000 entrepreneurs a year to pick 180 to go on the show. Here's what Scott says makes the difference. Any, any analyticals here? You think it's know your numbers, right? Oh, you got to know your numbers. You got to know your numbers cold. You got to know your numbers back and forth. That's true. But what Scott says is your story matters. Your story matters. We need a compelling story that, that personalizes this to go on the show. So they're looking for story. I said humans are hardwired for stories. You wanted the data. Go to the August 2008 Scientific American Mind. Uh, they have the power of stories as the cover story there. They looked at all the new research in neurosciences, psychology, uh, linguistics, what's happening about stories and how stories make an impact. And there are psychological reasons humans need to hear stories. It's psychology. We're hardwired. It's psychology. Oh, at this point in the rehearsal, my son Jordan, who's in college, said, I'm dad. Excuse me, dad. Uh, yeah, actually, that's Sigmund Freud. And the theories of Sigmund Freud have been widely discounted. You're really talking about Carl Jung, Jungian archetypes. And I said, Jordan, shut up. I can't find a Carl Jung puppet. It's just to show you that a lot of the research there shows that humans are hardwired for stories. There's certain things that we all need to hear. Vanderbilt University, study at Vanderbilt University. They took two groups, a control group, the subject group. The control group, they gave them all the facts and figures of the case, all the data that they needed. The subject group, they just came in and gave them a narrative, gave them a story. Guess which group was more persuaded? The group that got the narrative, that got the story. And there are reasons for that. And I'm not going to go into the brain and the neurosciences. And, and uh, I'm a social scientist. I can't explain stem cells or electricity or neurosciences. Uh, but I can tell you that the brain has different parts. It has the new part of the brain that handles data. It, it, it makes humans humans. It makes us who we are. You know, top of the food chain, Ma. We're at the top of the food chain because we can process data. But that's not where decisions are made. 
It's in the older brain where the emotions sit, and that's where the decisions are. Stories go right there. One of the books we published is called Storytelling for the Defense. It's for the legal industry, and it shows defense attorneys how they need to come up with compelling stories if they're to defend, because the studies that we did there showed that facts and figures don't sway juries. A good story is what sways. So that's what this is about. Uh, let's talk Hollywood. Hollywood. Um, how big of an industry is the entertainment industry? Well, the U.S. entertainment industry is a $635 billion industry. It would be a top 10 industry if we don't count the federal government. How many people here are, are willing not to count the federal government? Okay, show of hands. Okay, I see it. Me too. Uh, globally, $2 trillion industry. Now, we need energy. We need food. We need health care. We need technology. Do we need storytelling? Well, we want storytelling. We're willing to pay for it because stories allow us to feel an emotion. We call Hollywood the emotion picture capital of the world. And they know how to get emotions out there. So this is a great thing. If I could give you a piece of advice on storytelling, it's have a formula. The good news is there's only three parts to the formula. You learn this formula and you can tell stories to persuade job candidates to join the firm. You can tell stories that will persuade prospects to engage with you, to be customers and clients. You can persuade investors to invest in the company. There's just three characters you need. You need a hero, you need a villain, and you need a mentor. So this is Star Wars, 1977. Of course, we had Luke Skywalker, the orphan on a sand farm who gets in this great adventure. So we're rooting for the hero. Well, there's a villain. He wears black, has a cape and a mask. In this case, it's Darth Vader. Now, if you haven't figured out that I'm a nerd yet, I think you're getting the idea. So there's a third character, a mentor character. In this film, it's Yoda. So when you're telling stories and you're trying to attract prospects, you tell a story about a prospect. My prospect story was Bill Woodich, and I told you about Bill. That story helped me get a second round of financing for my company, Indie Books International. Please allow me to properly introduce myself. I'm the CEO of Indie Books International. I work with management consultants who want to attract high paying clients by marketing with a book and a speech. As a professional speaker, I tour the company, I tour the country teaching business leaders how to persuade job candidates, prospects, and investors with a story. In fact, I've told a few stories in the last decade. In the last 10 years, I have helped as a ghostwriter, a publisher, a book coach, an editor, with more than 300 business books, uh, including How to Close a Deal like Warren Buffett from McGraw-Hill, now in Chinese. Uh, so it's possible I'm very big in China. I don't know, but there's that possibility. Um, on a personal note, so you know me, I'm a baseball nut. I have visited 40 major league baseball parks, and I have three to go before I touch them all. I'm all about story. Your story matters. And when I help people with books and help people with speaking, that's my main message. Your story matters. And people are more interested in the story than all the facts and figures and data that you can provide because it gives them a context and it goes in. I was giving a speech in Los Angeles. I was at uh, one of the very large law firms. It was in a high rise in downtown LA. And 
Marvin, the managing director of the law firm, asked me to come back into his inner office when it was done. And I went back to Marvin's inner office, and there, there were movie posters. He had movie posters and some props and memorabilia, and he explained to me that his grandfather and his father were Hollywood producers. And he said, they always told me we only make eight movies in Hollywood, and I didn't know what they meant until I heard you speak today. I'll give you a quick, the eight movies that they make in Hollywood. They make the monster problem movie, overcoming the monster. Uh, this is Jaws and, and uh, the horror films and uh, something that has to be killed. I'll give you Jaws in 30 seconds if you haven't seen the film or haven't seen it in a while. Hey, everybody get in the water. That's gonna be good for tourism. Oh no, there's a shark. Get out of the water. Ugh. That's bad for tourism. Oh, wait a minute. Let's find somebody to kill the shark. I have a boat. I kill sharks. You're hired. I killed the shark. Everybody get out of the water. There's a great white shark. I'm going to need a bigger boat. That is the plot of Jaws. It's if you're telling a monster problem, if your product solves a monster problem that people have, you're telling a monster story. There's the underdog story. The underdog story is uh, it's an orphan or it's somebody plucky. It's a Cinderella type person uh, who has to overcome. If you're a little company, if you're the plucky little company going up against the big companies, you're telling an underdog story. In business, think Moneyball by Michael Lewis. Oh, we're the Oakland A's. We're poor. We don't have the money to compete with the New York Yankees or, or the Angels. What do we do? Idea. We'll find broken toy ball players and we'll gather them together. And the sum of the, the parts will be greater. And we'll win, we'll win, win. Until we reach the playoffs. And then you need really expensive pitching. So that's, that's it. Uh, Two other stories, there's the comedy story and the tragedy story. Oh, by the way, so you know, I have ruined movies for my family. I have ruined movies for my family because uh, we'll be sitting on the couch and it'll be some Disney movie and this father rat says to the son rat, oh, I know son, it's very, been very hard for you since your mother died, but uh, we go, oh, underdog rat. Rat wins in third act. You know, it's called Ratatouille if you want to see it. Or, or the cheerleaders come walking in. You know, they're all dressed in black, and they go up to the blonde cheerleaders, and they go, oh, no, this is not over. I'm going to see you at nationals. And my family goes, oh, antagonist, showdown, third act, blonde cheerleaders win. So I have ruined movies. So I hope I'm not going to ruin movies for you today. But you'll see these patterns. The comedy and tragedy. It's not about being funny or sad. In those stories and movies and business books, it's about how they solve a problem. If you solve a problem with a wacky idea, you're a comedy. Um, oh, I'm too short, I'm too old, I'm too Jewish, I can't get a part on Broadway, what will I do? Plucky idea. I know, I'll dress in drag, audition for a soap opera, what could possibly go wrong? Tootsie. Um, or if you want a more modern example, oh, we're lawyers in Washington. We're too busy to find dates. Wacky idea. Let's crash weddings and be wedding crashers. And hijinks ensue. There's a marriage at the end. Romance wins out. Okay, tragedy. A tragedy is when somebody tries to take a shortcut against nature, uh, against society, against law. Um, Hamlet, Othello, Lear, The Godfather, um, or how about this one? Oh, I'm a high school chemistry teacher and I have stage four cancer and I have no retirement money set up for my family. W what am I going to do? I know I'll make the Cadillac of meth in an RV in New Mexico. What could possibly go wrong? Breaking Bad. Um, I prefer Scarface. 
uh, because my father uh, was an immigrant to this country. I'm the son of an immigrant. We started a dairy farm here in Chino, California to get you that white stuff that you all want, your ice cream and your cream cheese and your, your sour cream. Yeah, that was us. Um, in the Scarface movie, Tony was an immigrant. He was from Cuba. He gave people the white stuff they wanted, uh, cocaine. Uh, you, I think you remember the movie with Al Pacino. He goes, uh, first you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the women. And I can respect him as an entrepreneur, but I think it would have been better if he'd chosen something else, some other white stuff, maybe like Amway detergent, you know, Amway. So it's like, first you get the product, then you get the downline distributors, and then you go to the incentive convention, and then you get the women. So it could have worked out that way. Okay, next story, the mystery story. Is it a mystery? Do we have to crack the code? Are we trying to unlock clues? Uh, these are basically Sherlock Holmes stories. And Sherlock Holmes is popular still. Uh, after, after Sir Arthur Conan Doyle came up with him, he's still, he's got a hit series on CBS. He's got a hit BBC movie series. He's got a hit Robert Downey Jr. movie series. And let's face it, every CSI is just Sherlock Holmes in disguise. Are you with me? I mean, clues, and we're looking with microscopes, and Bunsen burners, and, and I'm, I'm talking about CSI Las Vegas, CSI Miami, CSI New York, CSI Cleveland. Well, there is no CSI Cleveland yet, uh, but here's how it's gonna start when it does. I know one thing, Frank, he just made a mistake by the lake, and then the who will come on, Whoa! That will be CSI Cleveland, okay. It's a mystery story. Who moved my cheese? 12 million copies sold of that business book. Just a mystery. The next one is a quest. Think Indiana Jones. Uh, think the search for the, the, lost, the Ark of the Lost Covenant, the, the Holy Grail. If you're looking for King Solomon's mind, if you're looking to how to do a deal like Warren Buffett. That's a quest book that I wrote. A quest is you're telling a story going after a great prize. Two more. The rebirth story. If the company is coming back from the ashes, if it's the phoenix rising, if this is the redemption story, that's the rebirth story you're telling. It's like a Christmas carol. The, the Christmas Carol, Scrooge, you know, Christmas Carol, starts off, Marley was dead. Make no mistake about that. He was deader than a doornail. That's how that starts. And the implication is unless Scrooge gets redeemed, he's going to die too. If you're telling that kind of story, know the story that you're telling. The last one is the escape story. And this is when you're in a normal place, you go to a crazy place, and then you have to get out of the crazy place and get back to a normal place. Think Alice in Wonderland. Normal place, England, falls down the rabbit hole, you know, gets big, gets small, uh, playing cards, chasing around, trying to kill you. If, if Lewis Carroll wasn't doing drugs when he wrote that book, I, I, I can't believe it. I mean, that, that was a, one crazy book. Um, and then you escape. Okay, but my favorite is more American. It's those ruby red slippers of Dorothy Gale from Kansas, the Wizard of Oz, the most dysfunctional movie ever made, and you all put your children in front of TV sets every year to watch it. If I was gonna write the uh, DVR remote control button synopsis of that movie, it's girl arrives in strange land and kills makes three friends and kills again. That is the plot of The Wizard of Oz. Um, some people call it uh, the, the ultimate chick flick, two women fighting over a pair of shoes. I, I don't want to go there. Um, but the, the problem that I have with The Wizard of Oz is Glinda the Good Witch, uh, the bar is pretty low to be a good witch in Oz because her instructions to Dorothy is follow this yellow road through a haunted forest, through a poison poppy field, break into a fortress. 
when you get inside the fortress, find the man in charge and do whatever he says. He was a con man, and his instructions to Dorothy was, I need you to attack a bigger fortress on top of a mountain to kill a wicked witch who is guarded by a thousand flying monkeys. Yeah, if I'm Dorothy, I'm looking for a bucket of water to pour on her right about then. Oh, at the end of the story, if you forget, um, she said, all you have to do is click your heels three times and say there's no place like home, and it worked. Dorothy said, why didn't you tell me this when the house landed on the first witch? And Glenda said, you wouldn't have believed me. If I'm Dorothy, I'm going to say, you could have tried me. You could have tried me, right? Okay, so those are the eight stories. That's the advanced class. The basic stuff is just know you're telling stories about customers. You're telling stories about people who have joined the company. Uh, if you have a story about an investor where it worked out, you're telling those stories. And you're telling a story with a hero, a villain, and a villain can just be a challenge. It could be the economy, or it could be government regulation. It doesn't have to be a person. And then there's a mentor. You're the mentor. You're the mentor character. Now, you might wonder, has storytelling progressed in, in Hollywood? Well, let's look at 30 years. Uh, it used to be Luke, Darth, and Yoda. Yeah, now it's Ray, Kylo, and it seems uh, Mark Hamill has turned into Yoda uh, in The Last Jedi. It's the same formula. It's the basic same formula that you'll use to tell stories. Uh, Let's go back in the time machine. We're going to go back 15 years. The place is Pasadena, California. And I'm giving a persuade with a story seminar to an accounting firm. And it so happens that it's the second year in a row that I've been invited to speak to this accounting firm. And I said, when I was here last year, did I teach you how to talk your way out of a traffic ticket, how to persuade the officer not to give you a traffic ticket. And Reggie and Juan, just their hands shot up. They, oh, oh, and they wanted to testify. And Juan started. He goes, well, this year we had to go from Pasadena to downtown LA to a sketchy neighborhood. And Reggie and I were scared to go. But we went, and we drove the wrong way down a one-way street in front of LA Police Department headquarters. <laughs> if I have one piece of advice to give you about being pulled over by the law, it's choose your words wisely. So let me tell you, because Reggie and Juan were Henry trained. They knew what to do. So it went something like this. The first thing Juan was driving, first thing Juan did is he took his wallet out and he put it up on the dashboard. Uh, Reggie was in the passenger seat. He was able to open the glove compartment where the proof of insurance and car registration was before the officer cleared the car. Reggie then put his hands up on the window. Juan, in the driver's seat, put his hands up on the steering wheel, not in the 10 and 2 position, midnight. They're both there. So they're telling a story to the officer as the officer is walking up to the car before a word is spoken. What is the story? What's the message that they're sending? This is the audience participation part of the program. So what, what is the message that they're sending? Be safe. Be safe. I'm not a threat. We're guilty. Well, we're guilty. No, they weren't doing that. <laughs> I, I am so sorry about your driving history. OK. Um, they're saying, we're not going to shoot you. You can see our hands. We're doing that. So at the police academy, I believe at the police academy on the first day, all officers are taught to say the same thing when they approach the car and talk to you as the driver. What is that thing that they say? Before license and registration, they say something else? Well, your hands are already where you can see them, yeah. 
Thank you. Do you know why I pulled you over? What's your name? Anthony, now, Anthony you must have experience with this. Yeah. Do <laughs> so you know why I pulled you over? Um, yeah, so they're going to say, do you know why I pulled you over? Okay, I'm not proud of this fact. In the last decade, I've been pulled over ten times. I am proud to say I persuaded the officer all ten times not to give me a ticket. Would you like to know how that works? I'll tell you right now. The last time I was pulled over was in Phoenix, Arizona. I mentioned I'm a baseball nut. I go to spring training every year uh, out in Phoenix to, to see the Angels and the Dodgers and the Padres. And, and so I'm out there one year. You do other things besides baseball. We were uh, climbing, it's called uh, Camelback Mountain. It's more like Camelback Big Rock. Um, my friend uh, was faster than me. He went over on the other side and went over the other side too fast, uh, fell, wrecked up his knee, bleeding. He calls me on the cell phone. Could I come around and pick him up? We might have to go to urgent care. So I get in the car. I'm coming around. I'm in a residential area. I see a black and white coming in the other direction and all of a sudden flashes lights on come in and whip. And I look ahead at the sign and there's a posted speed limit sign It says 35 miles per hour. And I look at my speedometer and I was doing 45. So, officer pulls me over, comes up, wallet, hands, and do you know why I pulled you over? I said, yes, officer. Now here's what you do. Whatever you did, admit it freely and offer no excuse. An excuse, those words are not the words to use. I did it because, leave that out. That'll, that'll torpedo you every time. There's no excuse. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I'll say no excuse. I said, yes, officer. I was doing 45 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone. There's no excuse for that. Okay, right there, they're kind of startled. You're different than everybody else. And then here's the magic phrase. You're going to want to make a note of this. If you could let me off with a warning, I would certainly appreciate it. And if you can't, I certainly understand. Okay, there's some important here. I said choose your words carefully. If is an important word. If gives the power to the person you're talking to. Whenever you're asking for anything, don't ask for it directly. Say, if you could do this, I would appreciate it. You've given them the power. The other important word in that sentence is and. And, if you can't, I certainly understand. I'm on a mission to get people to quit using the word but. I want to get buts out of the mouths. First off, it's unsanitary. And it's very unpersuasive. Um, let me play a game. If somebody will play a game with me. Um, is it uh, Nancy? Nancy, will you play with me? OK, so this is just role playing. It's just a game. If Nancy came in and I said, oh, Nancy, it's good to see you. Um, that uh, necklace is nice. Uh, but I think some different earrings would look better with it. As opposed to if Nancy came in, I said, Nancy, you look really nice today. Uh, and I like that necklace. And, you know, my wife just had some earrings. And I think earrings like that would make that look even better. Did you like the sentence where I said but? Or did you like the sentence where I said and? And, because but negates everything you just said. When you call somebody in and said, well, let me tell you what a great job you're doing here, Fred. Uh, but... Yeah, there's either like, but, oh, what's the but? Yeah, the but negates it, so don't say but to the officer. So I said, if you could let me off with a warning, I'd really appreciate it, and if you can, I certainly understand. Doing 45 in a 35 mile an hour zone, no excuse for that. And the officer said, actually, Mr. DeVries, you were doing 45 in a 25 mile an hour zone. It doesn't change to 35 until you pass that sign. 
Did you know in the state of Arizona, it's a felony to drive 20 miles over the speed limit? I now have the right to impound your car and take you to jail. <laughs> Officer, there is no excuse for driving 45 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. If you could let me off with a warning, I would appreciate it. And if you can, I understand. He said, registration and proof of insurance. I reached in, handed it to him, and he said, this is last year's proof of insurance. I said, oh, sorry. I reach in, hand it to him, and he says, two years ago. <laughs> last chance. I reach in, and he goes, and sure enough, three years ago. I said, officer, there's no excuse for driving without your current proof of insurance. If you could let me off with a warning, I would appreciate it. And if you can't, I certainly understand. And the officer said, geez, you are killing me here. Uh, let me ask another question. Are you from California and you're here for spring training? Yes, officer. Is your current proof of insurance in an envelope on your desk at home? Yes, it is. Would you drive to California right now and go get it? Yes, I will, officer. And I drove away. Back to Juan and Reggie. Officer comes up. Reggie said, you have to know, we were scared because the LAPD, not exactly known for their public relations in traffic pullovers. So they came up. You know why I pulled you over? Yes, officer. We were going down the wrong way, down a one-way street past LA Police Department headquarters. There is no excuse for that. If you could let us off with a warning, we'd appreciate it. And if you can't, we certainly understand. And the officer said, guys, we all make mistakes. Let's just be more careful out here. Get on to Pasadena. And that's where they went back to. This is the power. So if I can leave one communications tip with you today, it's choose your words wisely when you're persuading people. Know the power of ifs, ands, and no buts. You need to tell stories that are about your prospects and other people and you're the mentor. There is one story, however, that you need to tell. And you need to get this story down pat. It's your defining story. All the time, you're going to be meeting with people, and they're going to want, well, how did you get into this? How did you get started? What was, what was the, the event? They'll ask it in many different ways, but they need to hear your story. Just like the, the sharks, they want to hear your compelling story. What is it? So you need to work on that. As an example, I will uh, give you mine. So. I'll never forget the day that Gary Hawk, my business coach, took me out for lunch at P.F. Chang's. And he asked me, what is your exit strategy? Oh, uh, I'm an MBA. Uh, you know, I've been to the Harvard Business School. I was waiting for somebody to ask me this question because I had one. I was running a large public relations and advertising agency in San Diego at the time. Uh, this was almost 20 years ago. And I said, well, Gary, exit strategy. Let me tell you about my exit strategy. I am going to grow this business over the next 10 years. I'm going to get it to be over a million dollars. Uh, I'm going to get it running like a top. And then I'm going to sell it to a strategic buyer. What I'm going to do then is teach consultants how to attract high paying clients by marketing with a book and a speech. It's hard. It's difficult. Uh, they're frustrated by marketing. I've cracked the code. I know how to do it. Gary said, wow, that was not the answer I expected. Do you mind if I ask you three follow-up questions? And I said, sure, go ahead. And he goes, well, one, how would you do this? And I said, well, I would write books. I would write articles. I would be a columnist somewhere. I would give seminars 
I would give speeches to groups. I would teach. And I would align with a university somewhere with a lot of trees, water. I think it's in Oregon. And Gary said, OK, wow, that's specific. Um, second question, because you seem very passionate. And I said, I am. And he goes, so why are you waiting 10 years to follow your passion? Ugh, that was a gut check question. I hate it when really good coaches and consultants ask you a gut check question like that. They call you on your stuff. So I did what all of you do when you're asked a hard question like that. I lied. I lied. I didn't know I was lying at the time. I hadn't met Bill Woodich yet. I didn't know it was my fear that was talking. My fear that I wouldn't be able to pull it off. The, the fear all of us as an entrepreneur have that, are we going to be able to pull this off? Are we just faking it till we make it? Uh, I, I said, well, yeah. I said, well, Gary, let me tell you. It's these clients we have, the contracts. I have employees. Uh, I have this lease. Uh, I have contracts and obligations. I have a wolf. I have a wolf at my door. And every day I have to get past this wolf at my door to get into the business and run it. Gary let me off the hook. He said, I get it. Wolf at the door. You want a different visual. There you go. The big bad wolf at the door. Have it, how many of you know about the big bad wolf at the door that we have to get past every day? OK. Gary let me off the hook, though. He knew it was my fear. He just said, OK, third question. How would you get started in a small way? Hmm. I said, a small way? I would put on a lunch and learn. And I would uh, let people bring a brown bag, or they could uh, buy pizza for five bucks if they wanted. And I'll tell them everything I know about attracting high-paying clients with books and speeches. So I took the last $2,000 I had in the business checking account. I bought a mailing list. I bought postage. I bought invitations. And I sent my invitations out. And they're out in the mail the week of 9-11-2001. Yeah, timing is everything in business, right? So when the jets hit the tower and the Pentagon, my invitations were in the mail. That year, five of the top 10 advertising and PR firms in San Diego went bankrupt. Uh, the other ones who didn't go bankrupt just hung on by that much, we almost went bankrupt, too. But a funny thing happened at the end of the month. My conference room was filled at the Lunch and Learn. People who wanted uh, you know, the pizza and to hear what I had to say. So I poured my heart out for 90 minutes. I told them everything I knew about attracting high-paying clients. And when I was done, I made the mistake of saying, are there any questions? Yes, Henry. I go, yes. How much would you charge to coach us to do this? Well, Gary Hawk never asked me that question. I had no business model. So I PFA'd, I pulled from air, and said $5,000. And the man said, check, or do you take credit card? The next month, I said 6000 I did a lunch and learn every month. I said 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10, 11, 12. Price did not matter. It was size of firm and how much of the heavy lifting I was willing to do. Um, just reinvented the business. Found a home for the employees, found a home for the clients, and just started doing this. And started giving seminars, started giving speeches, started writing books. I've written nine books with my name on it since then. I did a 10-year, $2 million study on how this works. I tied in with the Harvard Business School. Uh, executive education program, I got in the back door. Uh, some of you got in the front door of Harvard. I got in the back. My essay began 
based on the entrance criteria, you should not admit me to the Harvard Business School. <laughs> I then asked them to make a new decision based on new information. That not everybody who needed this information could attend Harvard. And I would become a missionary sharing this information around the country. And in fact, it's international. I've gone to other countries now to share this information. Uh, along the way, I'd been teaching at UC San Diego. The dean sent me a note that said, see me. Now, nothing good has ever happened in the history of business when you receive a note from a boss that says, see me. But I went in and the dean said, OK, now what is this I hear that you're going to quit teaching for us and you're going to go off to Oregon? I said, oh, that's my vision speech. You know, mission, vision, values. I gave her my vision speech. And she gave me that look like dogs look, you know, give you when they don't under, you know, the kind of the Scooby-Doo, what? And she said, I don't get it. You teach here. You're at one of the top 10 public universities. You were the president of the Alumni Association. You know everyone from the president of the university up in Oakland down to the janitor here, and they all like you. We're going to start you off with an academic administrative position. And I said, I'm sorry. Did a, a job interview just happen, and now a salary negotiation has broken out? Um, but I went to my advisory group. They said it's a no-brainer. Move your institute into the university. I would do that for four days a week. And on the fifth day, I would teach consultants and write books for them. What, uh, along the way, one of the consultants says, um, you say we should write a book. I don't know how to do that. You know how to do that. How much would you charge to write a book for me? PFA, I gave him a number, pulled from air. Uh, that was over 300 business books ago. Um, three years ago, I went into the dean's office and I said, I love you, I love the university, and I love our work. But for some reason, I love these consultants more. And they're having frustrations when I write the book for them getting it published. So I retired from the university and started Indie Books International. We have published over 50 books for thought leaders since then. Uh, we're on pace to do 100 in the next three years. Oh, by the way, the office I had at the university was in 1,200 forested acres looking out on the Pacific Ocean. Trees, water, the vision came true. But this story isn't about me. It's really about you. I'm going to ask you the same three questions. One, how would you persuade with a story? Well, we gave you the tips today. Uh, you get the three characters. Uh, you know what kind of story you're telling. Uh, two, what are you waiting for? So don't take this knowledge in today and say, oh, nice skill. I'll have to work on that one day. No, you can start working on this today. Because question number three is, how would you get started in a small way? Well, I've got the clue. Put together a story and practice with family and friends. A professional speaker will tell a story 30 times before they tell it in front of a real audience. So how do they tell it 30 times? They tell it to people they know. So pick your success story or pick your origin story, your defining story. Put a little story together. Practice, practice, practice. It's how you get to Carnegie Hall. It's how you improve any story that you're telling. So I'm going to leave you with four secrets here. Number one, humans are hardwired for stories. Number two, your story matters. Number three, choose your words wisely. And number four, get started today in a small way. Thank you.